Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Melanie. This is Adventures in Hostessville, and this is episode three of the Vintage Magazine Project, where I try to figure out history by digging through old magazines. And since it is January, we are working our way through the 1952 January Good Housekeeping. So this week, the article that I want to dig into is actually the cover article, 25 Smart Hats You Can Make at Home. And it's so much the cover article that down here, it also says 25 Smart Hats You Can Make at Home. What is a hat for? To protect your head? To keep your hair from flying? Keep the sun out of your eyes? Maybe. But surely, certainly, to make you prettier. A becoming hat is a background, centering attention on your face. To make the most of this magic, your face must live up to your hat. Step one, find the shape of your face. The simplest way is to outline your reflection in the mirror with a moist cake of soap. When you know what type you are, you can easily establish happy relations between you and your bonnet. Step two, put your skin in the pink of condition. If it is not so silky and clear as you would like, do something about it. Do your hair to flatter your face. A coiffure that fights with your face will frustrate any hat. And if no hat is becoming, you can be sure there is something wrong with your hair. Four. Take a top-to-toe look, and do remember that any hat is more becoming if you carry your head high. Five, attune your makeup to your hat. If your chapeau is pink, red, or orange, your lipstick must harmonize. So in circling my face with my moist cake of soap, I discovered that I am an oval. So I turned to this page, which says the ovals have it easy. They do say symmetry is the thing for you, so make your gently arched eyebrows as alike as you can. Brush mascara on your upper lashes so that they curl up in a long, dark fringe. The chignon hairdo is a classic for an oval face with regular features. Avoid side bangs. I've been doing my hair wrong for 44 years. A snug little Dutch cap that repeats the curve of your face is wonderful on you. There it is, people. I'm making a snug little Dutch cap. The Dutch cap apparently is a really popular style in the late 40s and early 50s. In fact, there's this ad in the magazine for spring-made uh, spring fabrics, spring kale fully combed per kale sheets with this adorable girl. I need, um, I need some Taylor's chalk. Hold on. Okay, I have to measure my head to see what head size I am. Whoop. Oh, my head is large. So the Spring Made Sheet Company was actually founded in the 1880s, I think, by this guy, Leroy Springs. Their original last name was Springsteen. They were Dutch. That's why there's a the little Dutch girl on their ad. Oh my gosh, at one point he had like four mills and two banks and a railroad, like he was, oh, and he also ran the water supply company. His partner is named Elliot White, and Leroy Springs marries Elliot White's daughter, and they have a son, and they name him after both parents, so he becomes Elliot White Springs. And this cat, <laughs> oh my gosh. So he's sort of your basic, like, lost generation kid. Right, he grows up super rich in South Carolina. And when it's time for college, he gets sent off to Princeton, where he's actually a classmate of F. Scott Fitzgerald. And they are sort of similar in their love of writing and in their love of liquor and lots of women. And the most romantic thing you can do, of course, is to be a pilot. Now, Elliot White Strings, doesn't know how to fly a plane, but he takes a few classes at the Princeton Aviation School, and then he heads off for <laughs> England and meets up with the uh, Royal Air Force, the RAF, and he's like, hey! And the RAF is like, who are you? 
And sort of surprisingly, because he's kind of a wastrel that doesn't know anything about flying, he's so good at it. And he becomes like the, the fifth ranking World War I air ace. He wins the Distinguished Flying Cross. He shoots down like a dozen German planes. He also crashes a lot of his planes because he has a habit of uh, flying really hungover. And he also lives it up during this period. He would come up with these crazy cocktails, like he would make eggnog out of powdered egg, army issue powdered egg, and then he would flavor mint juleps. It would just be liquor and a stick of chewing gum. What? It's supposed to be 18 by six. Oh. It is. Great. OK, um, moving on. So the war ends, and he decides that he's going to be a writer, just like Fitzgerald. He's maybe not as good as Fitzgerald. But he comes up with this book that he calls War Birds, Diary of an Unknown Aviator. The book is a huge success, and he continues to make a lot of money off of it all the way up into the 1950s, like 1951, the year before this magazine comes out. Uh, they're still doing another paperback edition of it. So very successful. And he starts writing other short stories. He writes a few novels, but mostly he writes short stories. And they're all sort of unsurprisingly about airline pilots that drink a lot of liquor and have a lot of sex. But it's kind of waning. It's getting now to be the end of the 1920s. He's been writing the same thing over and over. And his dad's like, you got to come back and help me out with this mill. I'm getting old. I'm kind of sick. They have never gotten along. But now his dad's like, come back to South Carolina. You're going to live here with me. And Elliot's like, yeah, I'll come back. But I'm not going to live there. I'm going to live in Grandpa White's house, which interestingly is still standing today. It is on the National Register of Historic Places, not because of Elliot White Springs, but because it was the, the location of the last known meeting of the full cabinet of the Confederacy. And in 1931, Leroy Springs dies and Elliot White Springs inherits this whole mill. This is a $7.25 million company in 1931 money. But there are some problems because Leroy Springs hasn't modernized everything in a long time. So a lot of the equipment that they have is obsolete. And the creditors are kind of at the door because, of course, we are now into the Great Depression. People are like, well, this place is going to be closed in about six minutes because he's either going to sell it, take the money and run, or he is going to run it into the ground inside of six months. Surprisingly, just like he surprisingly was a really great World War I ace, Elliot White Springs is aces at running a cotton mill. OK, I've got these pieces cut out. Um, they're sort of square, maybe. Uh, it's felt. can mush it around. And now I have to pin them together and then baste it so I can check it and see if it fits my gigantic pumpkin noggin. Elliot White Springs is now in charge of this cotton mill. He is got his work cut out for him because the cotton mill is not doing well and neither is the country. But what he does is he decides he is going to slash costs, but he is not going to do it by stopping work or laying anybody off. There are about 2,000 employees of the um, spring mills at this point. So what he does is he first off cuts a salary for himself. He's like, I don't need it. I've got a ton of money. And then he slashes dividends. Now at this point, the, com the company just makes what's called gray goods. So that would be the raw material, so just the fabric. And then it would be sent somewhere else, typically in the north, uh, where it would be then turned into pillowcases or sheets or towels or clothing or whatever. So they are just in charge of making the fabric. Nobody's buying fabric. It's the Great Depression. But he keeps making it. And he makes piles and piles and piles of it. And he just stockpiles it and keeps paying people and keeps going. This isn't, uh, <laughs> this isn't the right size. It matches here. And it doesn't match here. 
And the way I'm gonna fix that is to cut it off and make it match. Cause I'm a maverick. All right, so ultimately after about mm, pushing 10 years of this, he, the depression comes to an end and then suddenly the world is in World War II and the United States is in it as well. And there's rationing and there's shortages and nobody can get any fabric. And Elliot White Springs is like, oh, uh, let me just check the warehouses. So he gets all these military contracts and he doesn't turn down a single contract and he gets them all in on time. The military suddenly needs fabric for everything. They need it for uniforms and clothes and they need it for uh, gun covers for the Navy. They need it for cots and tents. They need it for nursing uniforms and operating theaters and they need it for tape. Like there's a thing I didn't think of. Uh, they supplied most of the country's tape because back then tape was cloth with a sticky sign on it. But Elliot White Springs wants to expand and make finished goods to sell. And to do that, it's gonna be a huge financial outlay because he doesn't have any of that equipment. Like he doesn't have sewing machines. He's got looms and he's got spindles. He's got a lot of them, but that does not help you make sheets. So what he decides to do is go on this massive advertising campaign. So he comes up with this logo of the, the Dutch girl, but he doesn't want just one girl in his ads. He wants all of the girls in his ads. Okay, so I tried the hat on my head. It does sort of fit. Um, also, I used this red felt because I already had it. What I didn't factor on is that the red and the white would look quite so um, handmaid's tail. So I've got this now sketched out to where I think I want it, so I have to actually go through and stitch it well. Elliot White Springs, post-war, is putting together this ad campaign. He's like, you know, what I would like to take inspiration from is my Dutch ancestors and pinup girls. And the ad men are like, we're not gonna do it because customers won't go for it because it's too risque, They'll, it'll make them mad. And so Elliot White Springs like, fine, I'll write it myself. And he does. He's got a whole series of them in the late 40s that are basically like, oh, the wind blew up and my spring made panties are showing. Or in some cases, my panties are falling off. The elastic stinks, should have gone with spring made. Like it's very bizarre. No, 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 this won't work. Where's the seam ripper? But there was definitely a certain amount of uproar and there were certain magazines that refused to print his ads. So he publishes this book he calls Clothes Make the Man. It's apparently just this weird amalgamation of copies of the ads, uh, history of the mill, and then just some of his war stories for fun throwing in. But like, by the way, did I tell you about the time I shot down all those Huns? The Good Housekeeping article suggested that I might want to wire it so I can bend it back from my face a little bit. I don't have any millinery wire, but I have this craft wire. I don't remember what I bought it for. And then to cover it up, I'm going to put some trim on it. Now I've got these various ribbons here and I have this one that actually looks very appropriately Dutch, but also may make it look even more costumey. So I'm just gonna use this cream stuff. So Elliot White Springs is gone, but his company is not. Spring Maid is still going strong. His son-in-law takes it over. Elliot White Springs' granddaughter takes over as CEO and president as well in the late 90s. It's during this period in, I think in 2000, that they score the coup of being the company that has the rights to uh, licensed characters from Harry Potter. And they also, at this point, they have the contract with Coca-Cola, they have the contract with NASCAR. They have since um, moved, headquarters have moved to Brazil. There's not much left of them still in Fort Mills, South Carolina. Okay, okay, it's a little red riding hood. It fits my head pretty well though. I cheated. 
I used the medium size instead. I didn't believe my head was large. Thanks so much for joining me, everybody. Um, I will post some more of these hats if you have a different shaped hat and you want to know what you should wear. Follow me on um, Facebook and Instagram. I'll put some of those there. And like I said, I'll put the do's and don'ts on my Patreon. Do subscribe to Adventures in Hostessville and don't waste time about it. That might be the dorkiest thing I've ever said.